Hello everyone, and welcome back to the lab. Today, we're looking at a really big computer, and I mean that literally. And that's why I have you over here, instead of at the desk. And that computer is... Oh, the Tatung Einstein, which as you can see, is way bigger than any other computer that I own, and probably the biggest 8-bit micro that I can think of. So, this computer um, is made by Tatung, which is a Taiwanese electronics company. Um, and if you're like me, you probably only recognize Tatung as a manufacturer of rice cookers. In Asia, their rice cookers are very popular. But um, up until I found this machine, I never even knew that Tatung made computers. But like most electronics companies in the 1980s, they had a go at making computers and Einstein was their attempt. And um, like many Asian microcomputers from the era, which mostly followed the MSX standard or something similar, the Einstein uses the Z80 microprocessor. And internally, it's quite similar to the MSX line of computers. But it's also quite similar to the ZX Spectrum line of computers, which were very popular here in the UK. And with an expansion card, which I don't have, unfortunately, although I'd be interested if anyone has one that they'd like to lend me, um, the Tatung Einstein can be made, at least mostly, ZX Spectrum compatible. And it has two micro drives here, two micro drive uh, compatible floppy drives, essentially, which don't take the normal size floppy drives, but instead have these narrower and longer ones. And it has two of those disks, disk drives, so it allows you to easily copy disks for the Spectrum on the Tatung Einstein. So that was one of the killer use cases for this machine. I purchased this machine from someone who told me that it wasn't working and that it was in pretty bad shape. And I thought, that'll be okay, I can repair it. But then when it arrived, I realized just how bad of a shape it was in. Um, it was covered in dirt, and I mean covered. Every little fine grain on the texturing of the plastic was filled with dirt. Um, there were paw prints on it, and the box smelled like cat urine. I grew up raising cats, so I can recognize that smell. And there's one thing about cat urine, there's no way to get it out. And there's definitely no way to get it out of cardboard. So getting rid of the box was a bit unfortunate. Had to throw away original packaging, which I don't like to do. I usually keep it over here in my storage closet. But instead, I had to throw it out because it just smelled too bad. And I couldn't keep that in my apartment. So cleaning this machine required a use of a lot of industrial chemicals, not just IPA. And I also used a magic eraser to get rid of many of the scuff marks, which unfortunately removed some of the texturing of the plastic. But I think it's better to have a clean computer with a little bit of um, a little bit less plastic texturing than a filthy computer with dirt ingrained into the plastic that you just can't get out. So uh, I think that's a fair trade. Unfortunately, I did that cleaning before I did the uh, YouTube channel, so none of that has been filmed. But I haven't done any of the internal troubleshooting for this machine yet, so that's what we're going to do now. Now I know it doesn't work, but we'll find out why it doesn't work and what we can do to fix it, um, so let's get to work. Taking a look at the Tatung Einstein. Okay, please excuse the mess on the table, I don't normally film here, so this is sort of my dumping ground for all my junk. but. Um, let's just open this up and take a look inside. Okay. Fortunately, the cover comes off very easily and it's very neatly organized inside. Okay. So, we have here the two disk drives, which are connected here by these cables, um, which join onto this header here. Here's the power supply which connects into the motherboard underneath here, just here. And we've got a, a bunch of chips here, most of which I don't recognize. We have here, I don't know if you can see, if I move the cable you can see it, this one here is the AY3 sound chip, which is very popular. I believe it was also used in the MSX computers, the MSX1 series of computers. Um, let's see, what else can I recognize here? Um, aside from the disk drives, we have, um, ah, here's the Z80 itself, the actual CPU. Oh wait, no, sorry, this is the Z80 CPU, this is just a uh, PIO 
So it's some sort of peripheral I.O. controller, I guess, for the Z80 here. Um, we've got what is probably a ROM chip here. Um, what else is there? Don't recognize many of the other things, although I imagine one of these is RAM. Maybe this is RAM, or these little ones are RAM. Probably the little ones, actually. Um, yeah, so in general, it's just a pretty standard Z80 machine. Um, and I'll take a look at the manual later on and really get to grips with it. But um, the current problem we're having here is that this machine doesn't work. Now this jumper cable was actually just an experiment that I was doing earlier, so I'll remove that now. Don't need that. So firstly, let's just double check that the power supply works. So I actually know that it works because I've already done this before, but we'll just repeat it just to, be, to make doubly sure that I didn't miss anything last time. So I'll just plug it in. Let me just get the cord out here. All right. So I have my multimeter here, which I will just put here. Actually, I'll put it this way so that you can also read the display. And we'll turn it on to voltage checking mode. And now I'm going to turn on the power supply. Hopefully nothing explodes. Don't think it will. There we go. Okay. The lights, the LED lights have come on, so that tells me at least power is coming through. And now let's just check some voltages. So here on the CPU, let's just see if we're getting... Okay, there's 3.8 volts there. I'm not sure which way this is oriented, but I'm pretty sure this way. 3.84 volts, and then over here, let's just check some of these other chips. Okay, this one doesn't seem to be having any voltage coming through. Try the sound chip. Okay, that's getting a good 4.9 volts, which is good. That's a nice 5 volt signal. Okay. All right, well, it does seem like the voltage is coming through, although I'm not sure what the right levels are for all of these chips. But it certainly seems like the power supply is working. Uh, in particular, we saw that good solid 5 volt power on the um, sound chip. I'm not sure why the CPU... Uh, maybe I'm just looking at the wrong pins here, but this is 3.8 volts, which is... A little strange. I would have thought it would be 5 volts or 3.3, but maybe 3.8 is fine. Um, but in any event, the power supply does seem to be working. But So let's try and hook it up to a RF output and see if we can get any display that way. Okay. So now we're going to try to connect this to the LCD TV, or one of my LCD TVs. And I think these LCD TVs are really useful because A, they have the correct aspect ratio, B, they connect to basically any SCART display as well as VGA, as well as S-Video, as well as um, RCA AV. So basically you can connect them to basically any old micro, uh, even 15 kilohertz VGA should be fine. Sorry, 15 hertz VGA. Um, so. These are really versatile displays. I have another one over there, which is an LG branded one, but basically I think for retro displays, you really can't go past an LCD TV. Um, I personally don't like using CRTs. They hurt my eyes. I can see the refresh rate too much and it really just, it's not ple very pleasant to use. Um, so I always use these LCD TVs when I can get away with it. So let's connect up the RF modulator here. here. Okay, now that's hooked up, we can turn on the TV. Okay, we'll switch its source to RF input. There 
There we go. I think that's it. Okay, we're getting static, which is normal, nothing's on. If I turn on the computer, nothing shows up, but that's possibly just because we need to tune it. So I'll go to the menu here, down, here we go. Um, we'll go down to auto and it should automatically scan through the spectrum to try and find a usable signal. So let's just see if it finds anything. This process can take a few minutes, so I might time lapse this depending on how long it takes. And if it doesn't find anything, then we'll try to isolate the problem by removing the RF modulator from the equation. So we'll instead use a monitor cable. Um, and if that doesn't solve the problem, then we know that the problem isn't in the um, RF modulator and it's somewhere else. But I do know that this doesn't work, so I don't expect to find any picture coming out here unless something's magically fixed itself, but we'll see. Oh, it seemed to find something there, or maybe it was just very, very heavy interference. Well, we'll keep going until it's done and then we'll see what it says. Okay, so it does seem to have found something. Uh, let me just get out of that. Yeah, so it seems to have found something, but it just seems to be a black screen, which isn't all that helpful. Um, so I'm just, just to be sure, I'm going to try to bypass the RF modulator and instead use RGB output. And I'll talk a bit more about how we're going to do that first. But then I, seeing as we're getting a black screen here, I suspect that we'll probably continue to get a black screen with the monitor output, but it's worth just getting rid of the RF because I haven't had very good luck with those in the past. So we'll get rid of the RF by replacing it with a monitor output and then just go from there and we'll see what else we can debug. Okay, so we tried the RF output and we didn't get any good results. So my next attempt is going to be to try to drive the display through the monitor cable out here. Now the reason I want to do that is because on my Dragon 32 computers, which I haven't shown you yet, um, I have very poor luck with the RF modulators. Um, very Typically the RF output is just completely unusable or barely barely visible on the um, LCD TV. So I have to rely on monitor output exclusively. Now I have a monitor output cable for the Dragon 32, but I don't have one for the Tatung Einstein. Um, and in fact, there's two ways you can drive the monitor output on the Tatung Einstein. Um, one is the default, which is YUV output and I have no way of connecting that to anything. But if you change some jumpers according to the manual, which I'll show on screen here, um, then you can switch the YUV output of the monitor jack here to uh, instead output RGB. And it should be possible to then make a nice cable to connect the DIN output on this jack to a VGA cable and then just run it as a normal, normal um, VGA signal straight into the LCD TV. So that's how we'll try to get some output out of it. This way we'll bypass the RF modulator and hopefully we'll get a signal. And if we don't, then that tells us that the problem isn't in the RF modulator and then we'll have to actually start looking at chips. Okay, so firstly, let's just switch those um, jumpers around as the manual instructs. So I've got a little lifter here that will help me to remove the jumpers. Um, Maybe I can help you see them if I remove this disk cable first. So let's just unplug the disk drive. So the jumpers are these jumpers here. And you can see, hopefully if you look very closely, you can see that they're all um, laid in vertically. In fact, I might be able to bring you down closer. Okay, so now you're a bit closer to the board. Hopefully you can still see the jumpers. Yes, you can. So these jumpers here are the ones that I want to change, right? 
Um, so let's just carefully remove them. So I'll use this tool here, which you, if you can get it underneath, then it's very nice to just lift out without damaging the jumpers. Because a lot of the time, these old jumpers, if you use something like pliers, you can easily just like destroy the pieces of plastic that hold it all together. So what the manual tells us to do is instead of laying them all out vertically on the 001 line, or 100 line rather, we lay them out horizontally, bridging the 100 line and the 101 line. And apparently this will switch the display output from YUV to RGB. So we'll just put all of those back in this way. And just taking a brief look over the rest of the board while we're here, looking at these capacitors, they certainly don't seem like they need replacing. I can not see any swelling whatsoever, and I can't see any corrosion or cap juice leaking out of them. They seem very clean, very tidy, so I really don't think any of that needs replacing. Um, despite the fact that the case was in very poor condition, the board itself seems to be in very good condition, so hopefully all we need to do is bypass the RF modulator and everything will be fine. So let's see what happens after we make our VGA cable and connect it up to this device. So I'll just hook back up the disk drive again, like this. There we go. And let's give it a go. All right, so here is the DIN connector that I'm going to use for the Einstein end of the RGB cable. So I think this just comes apart if I pull on it, or maybe I have to just press in a bit there. There we go. Now it should come out like that. You can pull it apart here. And I just need to solder wires onto this end of the connector, and this end goes into the Einstein. So I'm going to just lodge those into my foam like this so that it should stay put, stay upright. Now I need to cut some wires. So I've got some 28 gauge wire here that's multicolored, which suits our purpose as well. So I've got red, gr blue, green, and we can use yellow for the composite and brown for ground because after all, Brown is the color of earth. Okay, that should be more than long enough. So let me just trim these off here. There we go. So these are all the wires that we need. And now I just need to trim the ends and solder them on. So I'll trim all of them first. I'm using my wire stripper here. So this is 28 gauge. Just put it in the 28 gauge hole. And there we have nicely stripped wire. Okay, that's red. Get out. Yellow. Ground. Blue. And green. So with all of the wires um, now successfully trimmed, we have to solder them onto the connector. And this is one of those annoying situations where you really wish you had three arms because it's really hard to hold the wire in place, hold the connector in place, and hold the solder and the soldering iron all um, at the same time. So what I'm using here is a helping hand, which is kind of like this little suspended claw thing that I can attach to my desk. 
Um, and it works, kind of, but you'll see that each time I solder a different wire, I seem to be changing my technique for holding everything. And that's because I really couldn't find a satisfactory way to make this easy. It was quite tricky. In general, for each of the wires that I'm soldering here, I'm um, following the guide written in the manual for the Einstein. So from clock in a clockwise direction, where the empty slot is the 12 o'clock, is the northmost point, um, each of the pins is red, green, blue, sync, and then ground. And the center point in the middle is just not connected to anything. So I'm first soldering the red wire, and then the green wire, and then I'll do the um, blue, and then the yellow, and then the ground. And you can see here that we now have a completed cable, all nicely soldered up. Now, um, it doesn't look like my best work, but I did test this off screen with a continuity checker, and it's fine. Okay, so now that we have our nicely soldered cable, I'm going to get a length of heat shrink wrap that I'm going to use to bundle all of these wires together. We'll need at least this much, so let's say, yeah, about there. Oops, there we go. And now we can just feed each of the wires through. Come on, there we go. And they form a nice little sheath for all of those wires, like that. Then we put the case back on the um, plug, like so. There we are. Seems okay. Now we just from the end put the cable through. Might be a bit tricky to force them all through, but there we go. And now we can just push the cover over the top. And after an embarrassingly long time trying to get that on properly, I finally managed to do it, and we have a nicely completed DIN connector for our cable. So now it's on to the VGA part. Okay, so I have here my VGA connector. Um, and this one isn't a solder one. It's actually a breakout board. Like if I uh, open it up here, I can show you. Um, I think I can just push, or maybe I have to pull it open. Yeah, pull it open like this. And I get this breakout board here kind of hard to read, but we've got, oh, it's not numbered in sequential order, so it's 1, 6, 2, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12, and then 3, 8, 14, 13, 4, 5, 15, and ground. That's strange. Um, I'm not sure why that is, but I guess it's just because the VGA connector has 15 pins usually, and in three rows, and this has 15 pins in two rows, so it has to sort of flatten them out somehow, and this just happened to be the easiest way. And also, I should take a look at the front of the cable, or connector rather, to check the numbering, because I want to make sure that the numbers here match the numbers on my VGA pinout, which I'll show on the screen. Right, yes, this does look correct. This is the standard numbering for VGA, it says one. I don't know if you can see that on the camera. 
Very faintly though, it says one on this side. So it's one, two, three, four, five, and then, or wait, one, two, three, four, five. And then it says five again, six, seven, eight, nine. No, this must be six. It says five, but it must be six. This is six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I'm not sure why it seems to identify 5 and 6. It could be because they are actually both ground. Um, 5 and 6 are... Well, 5 is ground and 6 is ground for the red channel. And then there's 7, 8 are also... Um, grounds but for the green and blue channel and then on the breakout board here we also have a ground channel so I guess I'll just connect all of these to the same ground um, I think that's fine I don't think we have separate ground planes or anything so um, it should be okay to just connect all of these to the same ground plane so all right if I get my DIN cable here um, we're going to need Let's see, it's going to come in here, and we're going to need red to go to 1. Okay, so we'll need some more length there. And then green to go to 2, and then blue to 3. And then ground goes to 5 through to 10, and sync goes to um, the H sync, which can also double as composite sync on VGA which is, I believe, number 13. Okay. So we'll have a lot of ground connections to make, but in particular, this red cable, which is quite short, actually has to go all the way over to one here on the end. So that will be the tricky part. So I'm just gonna make this a bit longer. And while I am using my wire cutters to do this, I'm being very careful to just cut the outer casing, the heat shrink wrap, and not the wires themselves. That would be, of course, very bad. Now, we'll hold this in place with uh, this holder instead of screws, um, but we'll do that in a moment. Firstly, I need to Trim the end of these wires. Okay, now they all have their ends trimmed off. So, I should just be able to feed these in to the holes below. If I understand how these work correctly, you just put them in you grab your little screwdriver and you screw it down. So I tried wiring this thing up using this breakout box thing, but I actually find it way more annoying than just soldering it. Um, I guess people will go to great lengths to avoid using a soldering iron, but really this is just so annoying. Each time I try and screw this in, it's really hard to get a good grip on the wire, and so it just falls out each time. Maybe I need to use a thicker gauge wire for this to be effective or something, but using these thin wires, it's just such a nightmare to get these to hold. I managed to get one ground wire hold held, but wiring up every other ground wire like this is just going to be a nightmare. So I'm thinking what I might do is try to disassemble this thing um, and desolder the actual uh, breakout box here and then just solder on the wires directly to these pads. I think that would be much easier. Or I could perhaps see if I can put this in. Let's imagine that I were to put this in upside down. Can I put it in upside down? Yes, it does look like I can. So if I were to close it, it would be alright, right? I think I think it would be. Let me just see. Hmm. Maybe it won't. Yeah, maybe it doesn't. The case can't quite close over it. 
when it's like that. Okay. Um, still, I could probably... Can I... Let's just... Let me try unscrewing all of these. All right. So let's see if... If I were to just straighten all of these wires out a bit. If I were to have them running like this, could they run underneath something like that? Underneath here with enough space. Oh, maybe it went in this side. Did it, which side did it go in originally? I'm guessing it was originally like this. What's the problem? Or maybe it was originally like this. Yeah, okay, it was originally like this. So if I have my cables coming in here, underneath this thing, yeah, I think it can fit fine. If these wires weren't in the way, I think it would close up fine. And this doesn't pose an issue. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I am going to solder on the wires directly onto this PCB and ignore this thing on the top entirely. So this soldering job was substantially easier than connecting the wires to the DIN connector because the PCB didn't move around as much. Being flat, it doesn't fall over and flip over on its side or anything like that. So it was substantially easier. It was just like soldering anything else to any other circuit board. Um, so as you can see, I'm proceeding in the order of the um, DIN connector. So red, green, blue, sink, and then ground. And for the ground, because I have to make several connections, this will show on the little diagram here, um, I first used a couple of different lengths of wire, and then um, later on I realized that I can just strip some of the insulation off the middle part of a wire and have one single wire that just runs across all of the remaining ground connections. But I only realized that after I'd already soldered a couple of leads in there, so I used separate leads for a couple of the uh, connections, but then for the rest of the ground connections, I just use one. I also connected the ground on the PCB um, to the ground that we're using for our RGB connection, so the ground from the DIN connector. Um, I'm pretty sure that's the right thing to do, because I guess ground is ground. I don't think we have any kind of separate grounds here, so I think that's fine. And as always, let me remind you of the one rule of this channel. Never comment about my soldering technique no matter how mad it makes you. So that's the soldering done. And I appreciate it's quite messy, but I didn't really mind my, my cable lengths here. But should be fine if I just sort of hide all the mess and put it back in the case. So we'll just slot it back in here. Pretty sure this is where it belongs. There we go. Okay. Like that. And now we'll put the cover thing on like this. Should just be a matter of pressing down. Might be a bit tricky to get these to be cooperative, but we'll try it. So it's just a matter of screwing these in to force the cover down and hold the cord in place. I later redo this off camera so that that little plastic piece that I'm using as a sort of cap end to the cord also gets held down by the cover. But it's essentially the same as what I'm doing now. And here we have our cable. Nice and complete. Um, now what I'm going to do is just get a little bit of wire, maybe I could even just use my solder here, to check 
continuity on some of these. Here's my multimeter, here we are. So, turn that on to continuity checking mode, and let's just beep it out. Um, hold on, this should be this way. We want to start at pin one, this should be red. I think that's here, if I remember the pin that right, and we got continuity. And just check another pin, no continuity, good. All right, the next one, is I believe blue. Oh, yep. We have continuity there and no continuity on anything else. And the next one is, oh, sorry, that one was green. This one is blue, which we'll check here. Yep. And um, which one of these was sync? I think it was just the next one along. So this one should go into number 13, which is the middle one on the bottom row here, like that. And we have continuity there. Now let's check to the ground plane. This should be connected to, for example, among many others, 10. Oops. Jeez. Come on. Yep, it's got continuity as well. Okay, so it looks like our connections are all wired up. I didn't check all of the ground connections, but um, I'm assuming that that's going to be fine. And if we see any weird problems with a particular color channel, then we'll know that that was because of some problem with one of the solder joints there. But at least we should get a proper RGB signal through to the LCD TV using this cable. So let's give it a try. All right, so we have our VGA cable connected up here. This is our newly made adapter, hooked up to the VGA connector on this LCD TV. And the Einstein here is connected to power. So firstly, let me just turn on the LCD TV and switch it to the correct source, which is, I believe, PC in. Let's see what it says. Is this it? Nope, not this video. PC, here we go. Okay, so this is the VGA connection. So with that turned on, let's just try turning on the machine. Are we getting anything coming through here? Is it coming to life? Hmm, unfortunately, it doesn't look like we're getting anything. I'll just quickly. Oh, P1 mono. I don't know what that is. If I turn off the Einstein, does this change? Oh, I still have the RF connected. Right, that would be potentially an issue. If I disconnect the RF and then turn it back on, getting some interference from the uh, Einstein. If I switch back to PC input, do I get anything? No, just totally blank. No, not a signal at all, it just turns itself off. 
Okay, so that tells me that it's probably not producing anything at all on this monitor output display, which means that the display isn't being initialized. And I guess when the RF modulator receives power by default, if nothing's happening on the CPU or anything, then it just produces a black screen. So let me just quickly touch some of these chips to see if any of them are getting terribly warm because that's a surefire sign that they're broken. In particular, these RAM, these little RAM chips can often be culprits here. If they fail, they tend to heat very quickly and very warm. But so far, they're all pretty cold. I can't really feel any problem. Ooh, that's quite warm. What chip is that? The TMS 9129NL. I don't know what that is off the top of my head. I'll look that up though. It doesn't feel very hot, but it is warmer than the rest of the chips, that's for sure. Yeah, so this side of the board, this front side of the board, seems to be a little bit warmer. Definitely that TI chip is one of the warmest. Um, it's been a little while now, so let's just check these ones again. Let's check the CPU in particular. Yeah, the TPU is pretty much bone cold, stone cold. So um, that tells me that probably this system isn't initializing at all. But I really have no idea why. All of these chips look to be in good condition. I can't see any leaking capacitors or anything like that. The capacitors all look great. And um, I've tried isolating out the RF modulator and not using it, and it still doesn't seem to be the problem. So I'm really lost. I don't know what's going wrong. There does seem to be power coming into the system, but it's just not booting. Not at all. Nothing's happening. So if anyone has any ideas as to why this is happening, please do let me know. I don't have an oscilloscope or a logic probe, so I can't easily just get in here and debug this. Um, so I'm really at a loss. I might try to consult the hardware manual for this and just see if there's anything in there that would lead me to a possible reason why it's not booting. Um, and we can sort of maybe trace it back from first principles that way. But otherwise, I'm pretty much lost here, which is a big shame. I would really like to get this machine working. So if anyone has any suggestions or comments or they've used this machine themselves, please leave that in the comments section below. And maybe one day we can revive this Tartung Einstein, which in, is now, after a cleaning, in pretty good condition, I'd say. Ooh, this. This socketed chip here is getting a little bit warm too, but it's not its not like dead warm, it's just a little bit warm, as if it's getting some activity. CPU, okay, CPU is warming up slowly. It, it's just, this, ow, oh, okay, that chip is actually getting hot. I'm gonna look up this chip. It possibly could be a fault in this chip here, which is actually getting to the point of being painful to touch. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what chip that is though. It might be some sort of peripheral controller or the disk drive controller. Maybe it's trying to boot off disks and hanging there. I really don't know. I have no idea. Um, for now, I'm just gonna turn the machine off and we'll have to leave it at that for today. Well, that's gonna have to do it for today on the Tartung Einstein. It's a real shame that I haven't been able to get it working yet, but this video has gone on long enough with all of the cable making and everything. But if anyone has any suggestions on what I should do next to try and debug this thing and get it to boot, please let me know. It'd be real fun to try and uh, play around with this and actually make use of these disk drives and see if they still work or run some Einstein software, see what we can find on online or anything like that or from the community. And maybe even write our own software for the Einstein. That would be cool too. But that'll all have to wait until we can get this thing working. So if anyone has any suggestions, leave them in a comment below. Leave a like if you enjoyed the video, and if you want to see more, subscribe to the channel. And that'll be it. I'll see you next time.